Well, hey, good morning, church. I am excited about today. As you know, if you've been here for any length of time, this church is incredibly, incredibly passionate about your relationships. First of all, your relationship with Jesus. And then secondly, your relationship with specific people in your life, your wife, your husband, your kids, and how all of that looks like in our lives to honor God. Well, this morning, I am not with you, but I want you to meet a new friend of Burn Hickory this morning with some incredible expertise. We have Sean Stover with us this morning. Now listen, Sean comes with an incredible background of education and passion. He's worked for a long time with the Kathy family and Chick-fil-A. He's worked with Gary Smalley Relationship Center, and he leads many of the Windshape Marriage Retreats. He's authored a couple of books that maybe you have read on the wholehearted marriage or five days to a new marriage. But most importantly, Sean and his wife, Christina, that will be with us this evening, loves the Lord and loves looking at the lens of healthy relationships. Church, Melissa and I are out actually enjoying our marriage relationship and growing together on a trip that you gave us for our 20th anniversary. But I'm so happy to welcome to all the services today, Sean Stover. Would you give him a hand as he comes to lead us this morning? Thank you. Good morning. It is fall. Now, I'm sure the weather or the calendar don't tell you it is fall, but I saw football games yesterday, and in our family, that means it's fall. Anybody glad that that's happening? Yeah. So we love football. You're looking at me going, dude, you or kicker at best, holder possibly. You, what would you know about football? I don't. My wife is amazingly athletic. She played college on a basketball scholarship. All our kids get their athletic ability from her. And uh, we have some boys that play football. Our oldest son made his way through the ranks in small football here in Georgia. Actually, we were up in Rome, Georgia for a lot of years and working with Windshape and the Kathy family and Pee Wee football and playing around here. You guys have some great football in this part of the state. And then we moved back to Texas, and Texas loves football. Friday night's over there, high school football. And he's making his way through. He gets to ninth grade. He's got a great group of boys that he's playing with. They're doing really well. They have a, a solid quarterback, great line. They're winning games. They went all the way through their freshman season. They're undefeated going to the last game. And we drive a little over an hour and a half to a town that's got a really great football tradition. And uh, we're going to play them. And that town, though, didn't have a freshman team. They only had a varsity and a JV. And so our freshman boys are going to play their JV. And we match up, and we get out there, and it's going back and forth. It's a really good game. At the time, my son Kay was about five foot six, and uh, he was playing cornerback and slot receiver. And uh, the other team had a six foot five receiver. I'm not kidding you. I'm pretty sure he was 22 years old. Uh, <laughs> They don't, you know, if you keep failing, if you're a good athlete in some Texas towns, they just let you keep playing as long as you want to stick around. So uh, you knew it was coming. If you know anything about sports, they're going to find that weak spot at some point, right? And the game is back and forth. We're losing, and then we're winning again. We go ahead with a two minutes to go, and then they get the ball, and they're marching downfield. And sure enough, man, inside of a minute, they decide to run the out route, and they throw it up to this guy, and uh, he goes up and and. and Cade goes as high as he can, and he's not even close. This guy just gets it right over the top of him, and uh, it's a touchdown. We lose the game, and we, you can just watch. If you've ever seen your kids do something in sports, you see them get deflated and dejected, and we watched him uh, mope off the field, and uh, Christina and I are in the stands. Now, we handle things differently as parents. I don't know if you're just like your spouse if you're married, but uh, we're a little bit different, so I am feeling all of this sadness and this overwhelming helplessness. Like, what do I do? Christina doesn't feel helpless. She knows exactly what we should do. And in her opinion, what we should do is we should go tell the coaches that they were foolish to not roll a safety over the top and double cover in a situation like that and leave her son on an island. And because he did, he's now mad. The coach, we lost the game and all this stuff. And she's like, are you going or not? And I'm like, I don't think I want to go down there. And she said, you need to go down there. And I'm like, I don't want to go down there. And uh, I stalled long enough for everybody to get in the locker room. And uh, 
So a little bit of time passes, and, and then the players start coming out, and then here comes uh, Cade. He's one of the last ones out. He still has his helmet and his jersey on, and, and he comes up, and he is just bawling, and he puts his head on my shoulder, and he's crying, and Christina's like, I told you you should have gone and said something. I'm like, ah. and so then she's comforting him, and last game of the season, so they let him ride home with us. So in the car, he's in the back, still upset. He just keeps saying, I lost it. I let everybody down. We were undefeated. Now we're not, it's, you know, and... And Christina's like, come on, super psychologist boy, figure out what to say to him. And I'm like, I don't know. Well, they didn't teach us this stuff in grad school. And uh, so we make it home, and uh, it was terrible. I'm telling you that story uh, to say that relationships are everywhere, and you do not want to do life without them. Because if you're by yourself, when bad things happen, you're in trouble. But in that instance, Christina, I had relationship stuff going on. I had relationships going on with my son. He had relationship stuff going on with his, his uh, teammates and feeling like he let them down, the coaching staff, and then he had, you know, relationship stuff even with the opponent that, that defeated him in that moment, and he had relationship going on even with himself. Like, what did he feel about himself and how he was looking at himself or thinking about himself? We are surrounded by relationships. Life is about relationships. You guys here at Burnt Hickory, I love that you set a Sunday aside to talk about relationships like you do. I know this has been happening for a few years now, and I'm very thankful because if we can figure out how to do relationships well, we can make a difference in this crazy world, and we can have a lot better health and fulfillment and peace and joy in our own lives. What a cool series y'all have been in. Pastor Matt has been talking to you about moving forward, right? Talked about being, you know, kind of stuck and, and, and then making your way out toward the promised land and the, like the Israelites did. And you got the Jordan River and you don't look back. You keep moving forward. And once you move forward, you want to fully submit yourself. You want to be wholehearted, not half-hearted. Because if you have submit, bad consequences to that. They talked about that three weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we talked about prayer. He said that, you know, one of the tools to move forward is prayer. And in a really significant prayer time and prayer life that is consistent and dedicated and real. So that, that, was, that was important. But last week, man, that one really spoke to me. I, I hope it did to you. The idea of the power of God's word and the five points that he came up with, you know, we need to love God's word. We need to read his word. We need to share. We need to study his word, apply his word, and share his word. That's it. Those five. And uh, I, man, it hit me. Like, I, I, I want to do that. I want to love God's word so much that I do the other four things. You know, I read it, I, I, I study it, I apply it, and I share it. Good stuff that he's been giving you. It's the same way. I want to help you continue by moving forward in your relationships. And moving forward means we got to pick the right path as we go ahead. And as we pick that path, we need to find the right scriptures and verses to help guide and direct us so that we're applying those accurately in our lives. Jeremiah, if you're over there somewhere around Jeremiah chapter 6, it's a time in Israel's history where things aren't going well for God's people or they've turned their back on him. And uh, he's pretty frustrated. He's sad about it, but mostly he's mad about it. And he's about to do something about it. And Jeremiah is a prophet that's telling him what's about to happen. Even the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, is they've turned away from God as well and are doing bad things. It's not unlike where we are today, you guys, in our culture. A lot of things going on out there are moving very far away from God, and we find ourselves in those times. And he goes on in verse 10, 6, Jeremiah 6, 10, and he says, you know, they even find my word offensive. People are offended by God's word today. They were offended by his word, which is the opposite of Pastor Matt's point one about we have to love God's word. Are we going to be people that loves his word or are we going to be a little embarrassed or even offended by his word? We want to be the ones that love his word. And so Jeremiah is saying we have to find these people. And he gets into verse 16 and he says it this way. The, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. I'm going to try to convince you this morning that we are at a crossroads and we have to decide. Do we want to do God's will and God's way for our relationships? Or are we going to let moving forward be on the world's path and the world's way? We're standing at the crossroads. We're looking. He says, ask for the ancient paths. All right. I know there's a lot of young people over there, some folks that got baptized over here. When you hear the word ancient, you're probably tuning out about this point. You were like, I already thought that guy was ancient. He's gray-headed. He put glasses on to read just a second ago. He's going to tell us about relationships. He didn't even know anything about high school. That's probably true. Ancient, I mean, ancient is, I don't know what ancient is to you guys. Rotary dial phones, probably ancient. You know, <laughs> pulling a map out to figure out where you need to go, ancient. I get that. This is even way more ancient than that. He's saying we got to look way back, 
way back to the truths of the Bible and how to apply them. And then he goes on, keep going there in verse, I mean, you know, I've been saying that dyslexically all day, haven't I? It's, is it 616 or am I on the right one? That's right. All right. So it is. There we go. Jeremiah 616. Then he says this, ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But we, the people, oftentimes say we will not walk in it. We want to be a people who look at the ancient past, find the right way, and we walk in it. Have you ever hiked anywhere? There's some cool hiking trails here in North Georgia. The Appalachian Trail starts over there. There's lots of other good hikes you can do. Christina and I did this marriage adventure program that we started at Windshape up in Rome. And then we took those marriage adventures to different places in the world. And she was an amazing partner to me on most of those. When we were sailing with other couples, she loved that and loved doing that with me. You know, when we were traveling to cool places and doing adventures, she loved that. When I said, hey, we're going to go hike the Inca Trail in Peru, she's like, nah, I'm out. I'm like, what? no, it's a marriage adventure. She goes, no. How far are we walking? I'm like, 28 miles. She goes, why would we walk 28 miles? I'm like, well, that's how long the trail is. It's an ancient trail. We're going to walk it. And uh, she said, no, I don't think so. I said, you have to. It's a marriage adventure. We're doing it. And she's like, well, oh, whatever. Okay, so she went with me. Uh, she's a faithful, loving wife. And uh, I forgot to tell her a few things about hiking the Inca Trail. Like in the 28 miles, you start at 8,000 feet. You go up to 14,000 feet, back down to 10,000 it's about four days. You sleep in some tents uh, all, the whole time. There's no baths, no showers. There's us, that little picture. In the, that's not the sleep tent. That's actually where you go to the bathroom, that little tent. Oh, I forgot to tell her that, that we're going to the bathroom in a tent <laughs> over a bucket. And uh, that one picture, it looks like she's celebrating, which is why I put it on there in the middle. But she's actually saying, why did I marry this man and agree to come on this adventure? Uh, but it looks like she's celebrating, so I thought I'd put it in there too. This trail taught us a lot about relationships. So whether we're looking at a marriage relationship this morning or a parenting relationship or you guys, your relationship with your kids, relationship with your parents or relationship with our friends and your life group and your community and the people you are hanging out with, relationships matter and there are principles that apply and this journey theme is important, right? Because we learned one thing hiking that trail and that is you need a guide they gave us a guide to take us because there were lots of places we could have gone the wrong direction, but we had a good guide. If you want to do relationships well, you need to choose a guide. You're going to choose Instagram as your guide and the cool little quips that pop up daily and the advice that you get from influencers. You can do that. Or do you want to choose the guide who created us and invented relationships as your guide? That's, who you got, that's what you got to pick. You know, we also learned on this trip that who you journey with matters. Find people around you that encourage you, that are for you, that support you, speak truth and life into you. Who are you journeying beside? Man, if you're a teenager, you need to have people in your life who have the same values and encourage you toward your faith. Because the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. And that is true. And, and we say a lot of times, no, no, I'm going to go influence them. I'm going to be the one light in that group. And it, there are times for you to be that. But if you start looking more like them than they're looking like you, that's not the people you should be journeying with. Who are you picking to journey with? The third thing we learned on the trip is it gets hard sometimes. And you got to just stop and look at the beauty that's around you. Celebrate the successes along the way. So much you can learn while you journey. If we fast forward to the New Testament, Luke chapter 6, Jesus says something pretty similar about this choice, this fork in the road on our journey. He says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. Like Pastor Matt said, are we reading it? Are we studying it? And then are we following it? Are we applying it? It's like a person, he gives this metaphor, it's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. What, what are your relationships built on? 
Is there a solid foundation of truth that you're building your relationships on? Are you building them on emotions and feelings and opinions? Because we need to have a solid foundation in our marriages, in our homes, and in our friendships so that we can succeed ultimately. One other lesson that we learned on that trip hiking that Inca Trail. I also forgot to tell Christina that you don't have to walk 28 miles to get to Machu Picchu. That's, that's a cool way to get there. Uh, and and you, you earn it, and then you, and this amazing ancient city, and you get to see the archaeology and the history. But you also could just take a train and get there. <laughs> but I didn't tell her that. And uh, so we get to the last day, and we're about to head out there. And uh, I said, listen, this morning we're going to get there, and it's going to be so rewarding. And I said, but you're going to see some people there that took the train to get there. And she said, train? I said, yeah, it's an easy shortcut. They made it about, they're going to smell good and, you know, look refreshed. And uh, just know you're going to have resentment toward them. And she said, I'm not. I'm just going to be so glad we made it. Whatever. Okay. Tell me about the train next time. It's fine. Well, we hiked the last half day and we get there. And sure enough, about the third smelling good, looking good person that said, ma'am, ma'am, can you take our picture by this? She's like, you didn't earn it. You didn't walk here. I'm not taking your picture. And she kept on going. <laughs> Here's the deal. There are going to be people that take shortcuts in life. And you're going to see them. And it's going to look like they are succeeding. And you'll be like, but they did it the easy way. And look, it's working out for them. That doesn't last. Choose the path you want to walk. The world's way or God's way, and I assure you, God's way is tested. It is true, and it will persevere through hardship. So what are we talking about practically? We get to hang out with a lot of couples. I'm a psychologist to do these marriage intensives over the years, thousands of couples, and in making a list of the places they make wrong turns, I'm just going to pop about 11 of them up on the screen. All right, so we're going to buckle up. We're going to look at some of these, and we're going to look at all of them. Um, but these are the wrong paths. All right? I just want you to just read the list for a second. You know, I mean, the idea of being driven by fear, fear of failure, fear of being rejected, fear of being alone. And so we make desperate decisions because of that. Our selfishness, our pride, our desire to take control of situations, our fierce independence, our, you know, conforming to, to this world and its ways and, and wanting to do what culture's doing, our emptiness and our exhaustion. There's just a long list of the world's way. When you look at relationships, this is what's going on in the average relationship in our country. These principles are being applied consistently. Now, let's just be honest for a second. I'm not going to make you shout this out or... Uh, tell anybody else, but as you look at the list and you think about your relationships, in any places there may be some pain or some hurt or some discomfort, think of whether there's one or two of those things on the list that would apply in that relationship. Is there something going on there that's robbing you of having the kind of relationship that you want to have with God, with others, with yourself? And as you think about that, let's just kind of go through them and, and, and discuss them a little bit. Because each one of these are major forks in the road. And I can tell you that because Christina and I didn't start out in the best of circumstances. All right. She uh, loved the Lord from a young age. And she grew up in a Baptist church. She knew his principles. She came to college. And uh, she bumped into me in a bar. And uh, she would tell her parents, because she grew up in church, that she was there passing out tracts and witnessing to people. Um, I can assure you that's not what she was doing in the bar <laughs> at that time. Um, but thankfully, she did love the Lord and have that foundation. And we were talking about a second ago in Luke. And because she had that foundation, she pulled me toward him. Um, but we had a lot of bumps along the road in the pulling process. And uh, we had a dating career. When you start in a bad spot, young people, don't go try to find somebody in a bar. It doesn't work very well. It's very hard. Find somebody in your life group or Sunday school. It's a good place, all right? So here's a picture of us in our, in our dating years. And uh, if you look closely, you can see in the picture that it's got some tears in it, right? When you choose the wrong path and the wrong foundation, you're going to get some rips and some tears and some beat up along the way. During one of our breakups, Christina tore that picture up. And I said, well, if you tore it up, why didn't you just throw it away? And she said, well, I was just about to, but I looked at it again and I was having a really good hair day in that picture, so I thought I better keep it. <laughs> I said, all right, 
But you know, we patched it back up and we taped it back together. And we're like, uh, I don't know, man, 27, 28 years trying to do marriage now following God's way and his path. So as we look at these 11, the anecdotes that God has to those things that the world is trying to pull us toward. The first one is that instead of being driven by fear, he wants us to walk in truth. This one's foundational and it's critical. In the very beginning, there was Adam and Eve, and they had a really cool relationship. It was amazingly intimate, and yet they ate of this fruit, and after they ate of the fruit, they started doing anti-relational things, and after they did that, Adam said, hey, why are y'all acting this way? And they said, Adam said, well, we ate of the fruit, and we were, you know what they said next? Afraid. Fear entered the picture, all right? Fear entered the picture. There was no fear before that. They were hanging out with lions and tigers, and they were running around without clothes on in the jungle. All that sounds really scary to me. But they weren't scared until they ate of that fruit because the enemy's plan was to introduce fear into our lives and allow that to motivate us away from relationship. Fear, fear being alone, fear being disconnected, fear being helpless, fear being out of control, fear being a failure, fear being rejected, all of those buttons get inside us. And then they get triggered in relationship. And when they get triggered, we do one of two things, right? We either fight or we flee. I'm a fleer. Man, you, I start to feel rejected or helpless. I'm bailing on this thing. And I did that multiple times to Christina early in our, in our dating life and early in our marriage. And it was very unfair to her because I would run away and wouldn't address conflict when I got scared. Fear is the world's way. That's the enemy's way. God said, I didn't give you a spirit of fear. But we know now that we saw it right there in Genesis that they, we got that from the enemy and it's been introduced. And we all, at some point in life, that fear gets in us and it robs us of intimate relationship. God's way is different. He says, I want truth etched on the tablet of your heart to counteract any fear. I want you to know that you are worthy. You are valuable. You will never be alone. I will never forsake you. I want those truths to guide. Because when you live from that truth, you look really different. That's why he says in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The trauma in our life and the drama in our life is designed to create fear in us so that we will behave in anti-relational ways. God's plan is to heal the trauma, bring truth into our life so that we can walk in health and love for the people around us. Two different paths. If you've been in traumatic situations, had unhealthy environments around you, had buttons and fears written on your heart, get help. Go get help and help. let somebody speak truth into your life. The Bible is an amazing source of truth. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. And there are counselors and people and good friends who will speak truth into your life. That's the first one. The second divergence here on the trail, the ancient path versus the new world way, is that instead of selfishness and pride, the ancient path was about selflessness and humility. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. It's so easy to want to just think that I've got to, I've got to get what I need out of this relationship and out of this situation. I, I, I've, got to, I've got to be selfless. It's to the point that, I don't know if you understand, narcissism is now a real popular word in our culture. About 25 years ago, people didn't even know what that was because narcissism is a psychological disorder that at the extreme of selfishness, people have this inability to experience empathy for anybody or feelings for anybody else. It's all about them. Now, that's a real thing, and it's a real disorder, and it's, in, it's, it's unfortunately significantly on the rise in our culture because we've tolerated pride we've allowed selfishness which will ultimately if we keep allowing this we it ends up in narcissism and a lot of people get hurt in relationships and situations like that god's way is very divergent it's like hey we're not going to we're not going to look out for ourselves first instead we're going to look out for the needs of others and people around us we're going to humbly enter a relationship, not always trying to get our way or our point across or be heard, but instead wanting to consider what's going on in the hearts and the, the people around us. It's very different. The third divergent path is listening to understand instead of talking and being heard. Man, we live in a time and a culture where everybody wants to be heard. 
Social media is not all bad. There's a lot of connection points there and good information there. But there's also this amazing megaphone that people use because they want to be heard so desperately. Honestly, it's back to that fear because they have a fear of not being, you know, not being understood or not being seen or not being appreciated. So I'm just going to keep getting my message out there louder and louder. I want to be heard. But God's people in God's way says, you know what? Before that, let's be slow to speak. Let's be quick to listen. Listening is becoming a lost art. You guys are good at it. Y'all been doing it for about 15 minutes to me ramble on. But you got to do it in your relationships too, right? You got to be willing to listen. Not only listen, but listen to the point of understanding. The richest, smartest man who ever lived, Solomon, said, If it costs you everything you have, get understanding. 1 Peter 3.7 says, Husbands, live in your wives in an understanding way so as not to hinder your prayer life. This is different. To have to look at Christina and try to understand what's going on inside her. To look at my kids and try to understand. We do the simple thing in our house. This simple phrase. Jot this down if you got some notes. Help me understand. Three word phrase. It will change your relationships if you're willing to ask that of the people around you. When your kiddo barges off from the table and slams the door to their room. And our desire as a parent and first inkling is to go in there and say, hey, you can't do that. You can't talk back to your mom that way. You can't get up from the table without permission. You can't slam any doors in this house. If before you speak, you looked at them, you said, hey, help me understand what's going on. Help me understand why you walked away like that. Help me understand why you're so angry. The posture changes everything. And that's what God does when he talks to us. He doesn't throw verses at us like, well, let me tell you how you screwed that up and that up and that up. He just pauses to listen. That's what we want to be, a people that are good at listening to understand it will drastically change our relationships. Number four, willingness to submit. Willingness to submit instead of a need for control. Man, this is a big, big divergence in the road between our culture and the world. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit one to another as to Christ. So we're all submitting to Christ and we're submitting to each other. And Ephesians 5 talks about submission and submission in marriage. And it, it says, let me further define submission to one another. Men, you should submit so much that you're willing to lay down your life and die for your wife. And women, you should submit to your husband so much that you will respect them. That's a big deal. Submitting to each other, not what the world wants. The world says, get your way. Get, your, get what you need out of that. Take what you want. And God says, no, submit yourself. Submit your desires. Submit your needs for a moment and try to put the other people ahead of you. Number five, instead of influenced and fitting in with culture, intentional vision. Uh, man, we conform to this culture in so many ways. The pace of life is one of them. We conform to this culture and, you know, how we spend our time and the activities that we do. What you need instead, I'm not telling you the culture is all bad. What I'm telling you you need is vision. The antidote to that is vision. If you just let yourself drift, wherever, well, I don't know what I'm going to do this year. I'm just going to see what life has for me. Well, guess what? You're going to drift away from relationship, away from health, and away from God if that's your attitude. God says, instead, why don't you sit down with me and say, hey, Lord, where do you want me to be this year? What do you see for my marriage? What do you see for me as a parent? What do you see for me in my friendships? What, what life group do you think I should be a part of? What people should I be hanging out with? And you have intentional vision about creating whatever vision he, is, he lays out for you, a strategic plan around that. Your life will look very different. There's a proverb that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It goes so far as to say, you know, it's a, the other translation is, if there's no revelation, no time with God, we, we cast off restraint. It's the image of a boat just drifting that's not tied to a dock. We don't want to be drifters. We want to be intentionally getting somewhere. A guy named Scott, Scott Stanley wrote uh, a lot of research around marriage, and he said most young people and young married people in the last decade are sliding into relationship as opposed to deciding if they want to be in relationship. And he, the, the outcomes of sliding versus deciding are very drastic. The world's way is to just slide in. I'll just see. I'll test it out. I know they're not exactly like me. Their morals aren't exactly like me. But we'll live together a while and we'll just see how it works out. Man, the research on where that heads is, is very scary. Versus I know what kind of person I want. I know what kind of values I want them to have. And I need to, 
I need to decide if this is a good relationship or not. Now, that's not just about dating, though. That's about the friends that you choose and the people you hang out with even as you get older in your life. Decide who you need to be spending your time with. Let's keep rolling. Number six, intimate connection instead of fierce independence. Man, we were designed for intimate connection. That whole early on with Adam and Eve, them being naked uh, and unashamed, them being two flesh that became one, them walking physically, well, that's all intimacy. That's what God desires for us. But man, we're a, we're a country and a culture of independent thinkers and independent people. I'll tell you where I see it in my little community where I live. There are a bunch of 40-year-old married dads who somehow think they're still in a fraternity. And they act like it. They're not showing up as husbands. They're not showing up as dads. They find a place to go drink over lunch, a couple of beers, and talk about how bad their wife is and, and you know, how their kids are screwing up. And then they, you know, decide they want to go fishing or hunting or out to the lake and hang out till 1 or 2 in the morning and talk about the same bad things. About, and they're not doing anything to change any of it. They're just hanging out with a bunch of guys doing that. That is not what God meant when he said you need to have relationship with people. We need intimate connections. We need real connections. And in, verse, in point seven, instead of taking life too seriously, we need to enjoy life. We need to enjoy it. You guys, we take so much so seriously. We need to just stop and enjoy. Solomon, again, later in life after Proverbs, he wrote Ecclesiastes. And after he summed it all up, he said, life is hard. Life is difficult. He said, let me tell you two things. Ecclesiastes 3.12, he says, you need to enjoy life and you need to do good things. That's how I would sum up. And so if the smartest guy, the wisest guy that ever lived summed up life, it's probably worth hearing. And those are the two things he said. Just enjoy it. And along the way, do some good. And we need to be playing together. Y'all find people that you enjoy and do fun things with them. Laugh together, play together, experience adventure together. Have fun. Don't take your kids' stuff so serious. Don't let them take it so serious. Anxiety in our kids is at an all-time high, and a lot of it is because we are putting too much pressure on them as parents and as a culture. Let them have fun. Who cares what the score of the eight-year-old soccer game is? Nobody's going to remember. All right, keep moving through. A few more points. Point eight was instead of emptiness and exhaustion, God's way is restoration and fullness. God wants us to experience health. We can't, we can't do relationships well if we're empty and exhausted all the time. You just can't. You end up showing up thinking you're going to help somebody, but you're empty and exhausted, so you're just a vacuum, and you suck whatever life they have out of them. What God wants is us to be whole, full, healthy, and recharged spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. And when we're recharged in that way, we're going to show up and bless the socks off of people around us. Romans 15, 13 says, I pray that my joy would be in you, filling you up so that you would be complete, so that you could then overflow that hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants. Are you taking the time to slow down and say no to the right things? Say no to stuff so that you can be recharged and then show up for relationships in a healthy way. Point nine, show compassion and comfort instead of excuses and solutions. Man, so often in my communication, in my family, I'm trying to solve stuff. I'm solving stuff for everybody, and it's a good solution, and I fixed that for them, and I fixed Christina over there, and I did this, and people don't want me fixing them all the time. That's what I figured in my own house and in my friendships. Now, at work, you guys got to fix a lot. I get that. But at home, what they really need is some more compassion and some more care. It says frequently in scriptures, Jesus saw at least six times it says the phrase, Jesus saw. And each of those six times, it's followed by these words. Same words each time. And was moved with compassion. Jesus saw, and based on what he saw, he was moved with compassion. If that's what Jesus did, then maybe we ought to do that too. After that, it changed. Then it says, he was moved with compassion and healed. He was moved with compassion and taught. He was moved with compassion and shared. He he, different actions after that, but each time he stopped to see, and then he felt compassion, and then it changed how he interacted. How are you doing in that? When you see something, what's your first emotional reaction to that? Is it compassion and care, or is it judgment? Well, they got themselves into that. Well, that was a stupid decision they made. No wonder they're messed up like that. That's how I get when I'm empty and exhausted. I tend to be less compassionate, honestly. They kind of play together. 
Two more. Ten. Instead of taking control and hoarding, we need to give and share. Luke 6.38 says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We live in a culture that says you have to take Take what you can, get what you can out of everybody, hoard as much as you can, create a nest egg, create whatever you need to be secure and safe. Do it all on your own. But man, God's way is very different. I'm so excited for you guys. What's going on around here? A new building, new counseling center, new additions, because y'all are willing to be generous and share. I would love to come back in a few years and see the blessings on you as a group, as a people, as families, as a church, because your willingness to share and as opposed to take and hoard. That principle works the same way in relationships. And then the last point, persevere and delay gratification instead of giving up and expecting instant results. We live in a culture, in a time when people expect instant results. And if things are going bad, then we throw in the towel and move on to whatever's next. Instead of sticking it out and working through and doing the difficult work, the hard work, the godly work of forgiving and persisting. James goes so far as to say, consider it pure joy when you face trials because then you can persevere. Romans says trials produce perseverance, perseverance, character, and character grows hope in Jesus. We need to learn to persevere. Uh, we got home from the football game and got in the house and uh, Cade went up to to shower and Christina and I worked out our relational stuff downstairs and she was right, I needed to do something. And uh, so I went upstairs. One of the rules in our house is you don't, you don't mourn alone and you don't celebrate alone. We do that, you know, we don't ever let anybody be by themselves in that. So I go upstairs. He's a 14-year-old boy at the time. He wasn't really crazy about me coming in his room. But I said, I'm coming in. He was still really sad. And uh, I just got in bed with him and put my arms around him and, and uh, said, you want to pray together? He said, no. I said, can I pray over you? He said, okay. So I'm praying and he's reluctantly participating. Um, and then I, I remember it at the end of my prayer. I was like, hey, you know, my dad used to quote this poem to me, uh, the, or the speech to me. And uh, I said, it just seems appropriate. And I, I remembered as much as I could and shared it and went back and looked at more. But it's, it's Roosevelt's uh, Man in the Arena, if you ever heard it. And, and it, he says, you know, it's not the critic that counts. It's, it's not the one who points out where the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, but nevertheless tries. And then it kind of goes on a little bit more. And then at the end it says, because that person may win incredibly, but they may fail. And if they fail, at least they fail while, da while daring greatly. So their place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. The tendency could be, you guys, in relationships for us to isolate ourselves. Because that arena of relationship is messy and scary and you're going to get beat up in it. But it is worth it. It is worth being in the arena that you can experience the joy that comes from being there. It was the last game of the year. Cade was done. But by the next year, he had worked hard, and, he, and he, he just got better at football and better and became the best on his team and then the MVP of the district. And then he got a Division I scholarship and played football in college at a really undersized um, stature. Never gave up. And it, it, you know, it was because of the people around him speaking life and encouragement that you need people like that in your life. You need to be a person who doesn't give up. You need to be a person who encourages others to not give up. We need that for each other. We'll pop the whole list up on the screen. So God's path in relationships. There's so many principles, so many verses. I get it, but there's 11. So as we wrap up our time, I want you to think about which of those would you like to apply this week? Which are you willing to apply this week? Out of all 11, which one? If you picked them all, you're going to fall short. But if you pick one, you may succeed. Pastor Matt said, we need to hear the word, you know, we need to study it, and then we need to apply it. So which one are you going to apply? I literally want you to pick a number. I'm about to get your hands ready. You're going to hold up whatever number you pick. And I, don't, I know there's probably some nine-fingered folks here, but there's probably no 11-fingered people. So I know that one's going to be hard, but do, do this if you're 11, okay? 
All right, so whatever number, when I say go, I want you to hold it up. Hold it up boldly and proudly. Which one are you going to work on and apply this week? Ready? One, two, three, go. All right, good job. Good job. I'll close with, uh, we're going to put them, close with this verse. Eugene Peterson said it this way. He was translating Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30 in his, in his message translation. And he said, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion or relationships? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Hear that? Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to freely live. That's what we want. Guys, I want, you to, I want you to live freely in your relationships and, and experience the lightness and the beauty of that. But it's going to get hard sometimes, but you fight through that too. It's worth it. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much that you came to save us. You died on that cross so that we could have relationship with you, restore relationship with a God who loves us. Help us to walk boldly into that relationship. Help us to trust you. For those who are listening who don't know you yet, online or here in person, who don't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that they would understand that you want relationship desperately with them, and it's possible. Lord, I, I pray that for those of us who know you, we would pass your love along to others. We would boldly pursue relationships. We would get up when we get knocked down. We would ask for forgiveness when we fall short. We would give forgiveness when it is needed, even when it's not asked. And we would be a people of compassion and truth and selflessness and humility. We'll walk toward that, Lord. Please help us. Thank you for the folks that are here who want to be better and do better and apply your word in their lives in powerful ways. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.